Well, Pranhanda, our Chrysler Canes, the Bovino Honaki, the Senev, the Varlith, Michael Ryle, Duiville, Triad Higain. A very warm welcome to everybody here in Cardiff and online to the 2023 uh, Michael Ryle Memorial Lecture. Now, for those who don't know Michael Ryle, don't know about Michael Ryle, just say a few words about him first. And I know that listening online are some of his family who we welcome very much to uh, an online listening to this lecture. Uh, Michael was uh, the most innovative clerk of the last century in the House of Commons. And I think he'd been delighted that this evening's talk is about innovation in Parliament. Uh, he was a person who founded with Bernard Crick the Study of Parliament group. And uh, it's entirely right that the group should carry on remembering Michael through this lecture which we do each year. I'm very del delighted to be here, and I feel rather cheeky being here in the building of the Llawil, introducing her to you, because this is her building, not, not, not mine. Uh, but we're so pleased that we've got with us the senior of the presiding officers of the United Kingdom's parliaments, uh, the Right Honorable Ellen Jones, who's been uh, the Llawil here since uh, 2016, elected again in 2021. Ellen is uh, a, a daughter of the second best county in Wales, Ceredigion, Cardiganshire. Uh, she, I think, was brought up in uh, Llanbed upon Stefan, Lampeter, uh, went to University in Aberystwyth, and uh, now lives in that wonderful town of Aberaron. Uh, Ellen was elected uh, as in 1999 as a Plaid Cymru member for Ceredigion and has been elected in every election since as the Plaid Cymru member for Ceredigion. She is one of the three members of the Senev who have been here since 1999. There are two men, uh, two women and one man. Uh, so that is entirely how the gender split in this assembly this, I'm sorry, I'm using old speak in this parliament ought to work. Uh, she has been a spokesperson for Plaid Cymru in opposition and during the time of the Plaid Cymru Labour government, she was the Minister for Rural Affairs. So she has an enormous experience of this place and a great experience of being the Llawydd person who steers uh, this institution and uh, we're looking forward very much to hearing from her. So Guy, uh, Wahov, Ellen, E, uh, Roy, uh, Darlith, Michael Ryle, Eleni, Jochebar. Mawr iawn am y geiriau credyg for the uh, warm words of uh, welcome and introduction. Uh, you've memorised my CV very well, all correct, apart from one point, and I'll come to that in a minute now. Um, uh, uh, good evening to you all, and um, warm welcome to some of you to uh, our Senedd, uh, and I know that a number of people are joining us uh, online as well. Um, and thank you, uh, to start with for inviting me to deliver this year's Michael Ryle Memorial Lecture. And I understand, uh, if I'm correct, that some of Michael Ryle's family are joining us um, uh, this evening online. And I hope that uh, what I'm about to share tonight does justice to his life's work. Uh, despite not having had the pleasure of knowing Michael, the warmth and respect with which his friends and colleagues remember him a testament to his legacy as a pioneer of parliamentary reform. I must apologize in advance if much of what I have to say this evening is familiar to some of you as immediate colleagues of mine, but I hope you will uh, nonetheless enjoy reflecting on some of your recent achievements as I share with our friends from other parliaments a brief history of uh, the Senate's innovation. 
We are gathered this evening in the Neyad, or Hall of the Senedd, a hub usually for school visits, celebrations, commemorations, and much more, with a modern wood-clad debating chamber uh, just behind all of you in the audience. Behind me, the glass panes are not walls to keep people out, but rather windows to welcome them in, although they are curtained uh, as we, uh, as we uh, speak. And they are the realization of two architects' vision, Lord Richard Rogers and Ivan Harbour, um, both um, designing a building that was both transparent and accessible as the home of Welsh democracy. For those less familiar with the history of this pioneering building, I should note that business would, was not always conducted in the chamber of today, but next door in Shambar Howell, named, of course, after Howell Dha, or Howell the Good, king of the De Heibarth, uh, the king of southwest of Wales, who is credited with codifying Welsh law during the 10th century. So whilst the Senate may be a fledgling parliament in some senses still, the very idea of Welsh law dates back to the Middle Ages. I was elected, as Paul said, to that very first National Assembly. And loath as I am to correct Paul Silk, um, there are four of us who are original members now still serving in the sixth term. Um, three women and one men. The ratio is even better in favor of women than, uh, uh, than as you outlined. So there are four of us as the original members, the class of 99, as we like to call ourselves. Um, looking back at the first few years of the National Assembly for Wales, it is difficult to comprehend, really, the pace of change this place has experienced. But, so that will be the focus of my remarks this evening, progress and innovation. Words that not only pay homage to Michael Ryle's past work, but words that can also, I hope, serve as benchmarks which ensure that our respective parliaments are not only fit for purpose now, but fit for the future too. Despite the very notion of a parliament for Wales being rejected by the electorate during the 1979 referendum, the debate surrounding devolution did not lie dormant for long. By the time of the next referendum, 18 years later, the Yes campaign secured a swing of 30% against a backdrop of growing indignation with the Westminster UK government and the campaign for a National Assembly of Wales was won. A key figure throughout this period, of course, was the late Lord John Morris, who passed away only last week. He was Secretary of State for Wales in Jim Callaghan's government during the first referendum and Attorney General in the Blair government during the latter referendum. Without Lord Morris and others like him advocating so passionately for devolution, Wales would not have the parliament of its own today. Fast forward a quarter of a century and here we are. New powers, a new name and a new seat for Welsh democracy. And not only new, but novel. Perhaps it's down to my habit of doing things a little differently that I take such pride in this parliament charting its own course. I was a school election conservative candidate, believe it or not, turned Plaid Cymru elected politician. That serves me in good stead when I'm trying to persuade the conservative members here of a particular issue. I'm also a farmer's daughter, a, sh a sheep farmer's daughter who doesn't eat lamb. I'm possibly the first ever speaker to start a parliamentary session in song. And I am the first presiding officer to be member in charge of a piece of landmark legislation focused on electoral reform. I was elected presiding officer in 2016, and I did so on the basis that I wanted to do something with the job, not just do the job. So back in February 2017, I announced the establishment of an independent expert panel on electoral reform to provide robust, politically impartial advice on three topics. The number of members needed to effectively represent the people of Wales, the most suitable electoral system, and the minimum voting age. The expert panel that was chaired by Laura McAllister, Professor Laura McAllister, who is here tonight, made a series of recommendations in these areas, including lowering the voting age to 16, following in the footsteps, of course, of our colleagues in Scotland. The panel also concluded, after extensive research into international and UK comparators, that in order to operate as effectively as possible for the people of Wales, the Senate should move to a more proportional electoral system and increase its capacity. 
To quote the report on the number of members, it said, if the assembly had the same average number of members per head of population as the 16 devolved institutions in Europe, Canada and Australia with populations between two and four million, it would have a membership of 86. If the nine states of the USA with similar populations were also included, the number would be 91, comparing, compared to, of course, the 60 members we currently have. Whilst I am on the record as stating that my personal preference would have, to be, would have been to legislate on all these recommendations in one bill, in one go, we all know that the last word is decided by the political will of the day. So in the absence of consensus on how best to change the electoral system and how many members this should, place should have, the Senate and Elections Wales Bill was introduced on the 12th of January 2019 to extend the franchise to 16 and 17 year olds to give the institution a new name, Senate Cymru Welsh Parliament, which better reflects its status as a full lawmaking body. On the 6th of May, 2020, when the new legislation came into force, and only a few months into a global pandemic, the very first meeting of Senate Cymru, attended by members of the Welsh Parliament, was chaired by the Speaker, me, on my sofa in my front room in Aberaeron. A visual um, photograph of, uh, uh, of that event uh, is here. It'll be, I, I think it'll be one of those pub quiz questions uh, one day, where was the first meeting of Senate Cymru Welsh Parliament chaired? And there will be one geek, one parliamentary geek in that, uh, in that pub quiz uh, audience, and they will know it was chaired in Aberaeron, not in Cardiff Bay. Um, as member of, a member in charge of that bill, now ACT, of course, I'm proud of how Senate Commission officials worked constructively with Welsh Government to devise and develop this pioneering legislation and for the immensely valuable advice they gave me as we navigated and charted waters together. But four years on, and despite this progress, a restlessness remains among the growing number who believe that Senate members are still stretched too thinly and that consequently the people of Wales are underrepresented. One of, example of this is office holders. Returning to the report of the expert panel on electoral reform, data shows that while Whilst 45% of members in the Scottish Parliament are office holders, including executive roles, presiding officers and deputies, committee chairs, the equivalent figure for us here is, was 63%. A similar comparison in February 2017 with the House of Commons showed that there, are, that there were some 500 MPs who did not hold either executive or office holder roles. And of those MPs, 115 were backbench MPs who did not sit on any committee or hold any other additional roles. As a Senate member elected here, I cannot conceive what must be an unbearable lightness of being elected to Parliament, but not being a member of any committee, government or front bench. Some of our members in this Senate chair one committee and serve on one or more other committees, and that, uh, hopefully, we'll all agree, is unsustainable. So whilst addressing members' capacity to give electors the, ver the most effective representation possible had to wait in 2019, today we are in a very different context. The cooperation agreement between the Welsh Government and Plaid Cymru treads new territory when it comes to the relationship between the government and an opposition party. It was forged from the political reality of the election result of May 21, 30 Labour members elected and 30 opposition party members. Coalition was not on the table from Labour and some creative thinking was needed to ensure government stability for a five-year term. The cooperation agreement was the culmination of talks between Plaid Cymru and the Welsh Government during the summer of 21, which explored defined policy priorities where both parties could find common ground. The agreement was formally published on the 1st of December 21, and was unprecedented in nature. Indeed, its very inception was the subject of considerable discussion by the business committee of the Senate on the potential impact on the proper conduct of Senate business. This led to the Senate Commission seeking legal advice on a question that would delight any political honorer. A question 
as a result of the cooperation agreement is the Plaid Cymru Group, a group with an executive role as set out in Section 25.8 of the Government of Wales Act 2006. And if that wasn't enough for the parliamentary historians of the future, we also have a new entry in our lexicon, the designated member. Three Senate members from the Plaid Cymru Group became designated members with access to the civil service and two special advisors were nominated by Plaid Cymru and dedicated to working on the agreement. Working closely with government ministers and their officials, the designated members and their special advisors are halfway through a three-year deal developing policy in the 46 areas identified within the agreement. And yes, one of those areas is electoral reform. The cooperation agreement has committed to acting on the recommendations of the Special Purpose Committee on Electoral Reform which was established in 2021 and which I will return to later. But in short, in just a few months' time, we expect a bill to be formally introduced by the Welsh Government that will legislate to increase the number of members elected to the Senate from 60 to 96. It is also anticipated that the current constituencies will be replaced by 16 constituencies, each one formed by pairing the 32 Westminster constituencies proposed as part of the UK government reform and each one electing six Senate members. After nearly 25 years as Ellen Caradigion, uh, my constituency, I must admit to feeling a tinge of territoriality about my square mile, my Milter Square, but I'm optimistic that all members of the Senate, Senate, whoever they may be, will embrace these changes with agility and goodwill. I hope you've already got a taste for the ever-changing political context in which we are operating, which brings me to the next theme I want to reflect upon with you this evening, and that's purpose. If you've ever visited the Senate website, I'm sure you all have, you will have seen a succinct explainer set out as follows. The Welsh Parliament is the democratically elected body that represents the interests of Wales and its people. Commonly known as the Senate, it makes laws for Wales, agrees Welsh taxes, ta no, it doesn't agree Welsh taxes, in fact, we don't have power on taxes, uh, if I'm, agrees Welsh taxes and um, holds the Welsh government to account. For me, it is that reference to holding the Welsh government to account which goes to the heart of this parliament's purpose and which has served as the key driver of innovation over the last few years. As I mentioned at the start, this Senate stands on the shoulders of people such as John Morris, who, when Secretary of State for Wales, ensured the transfer of more functions from other UK de departments to the Welsh office during the 1970s. The exercise of those functions deserved direct scrutiny. And in 1999, we began that purpose of democratic direct scrutiny. Like all parliaments in the world, when COVID struck, our sole focus as an institution, beyond the safety and well-being of our staff and members, of course, was on how we effectively continue to fulfill our purpose. How could we discuss, debate and scrutinize together whilst staying apart? To make things a little more challenging, a day into lockdown, I tested positive for COVID. So confined to the constituency with strict travel restrictions in place, I asked Senate officials, to explore how we could metaphorically move the chamber chair from Cardiff Bay to Cardigan Bay. I'd heard of something called Zoom that was meant to be much better than Skype, and it needed to be much better than Skype with what lay ahead of us. And at this point, I would like to pay a heartfelt thanks to our ICT staff, who I count amongst the most skillful ICT staff of any parliament. They displayed ambition and innovation in equal measure to enable our parliament to meet in virtual form for the first time in its history. And I remain personally convinced that this would not have been possible had we not opted for having our ICT infrastructure managed in-house, allowing us to communicate effectively and move at pace and not be dependent on a third party contractor. In fact, except for the Maldives who met just two days before, before us, we believe that the Senate was the first parliament in the world to meet virtually on the 1st of April 2020. So as the world learned to mute and unmute itself, and our health minister was the first viral victim of forgetting to mute himself and use highly unparliamentary language about 
a scrutiny question coming from a fellow Labour colleague. So colleagues from across the globe look to Wales, from Australia, New Zealand, Canada and the Republic of Ireland, and were eager for us to share best practice and the lessons we had rapidly learned since the beginning of lockdown. But our ICT teams did not work alone, of course. A small, skillful and dedicated team of clerks and other officials demonstrated real procedural innovation to ensure that standing orders were swiftly amended and adopted to adequately support parliamentary, for parliamentary process in virtual form. All of that innovation was not in vain. And more than three years later, hybrid working has become a permanent feature of how we conduct Senate business. And with members praising the flexibility it presents, it seems to be here to stay. Hybrid working enables parliamentary agility. An example to you from yesterday. As our pl plenary session was about to begin yesterday, a story broke on the BBC that the health minister had apparently misled the Senate last week when speaking about the current political hot potato in Wales of the Betsy Cadwallader Health Board. I was asked for a topical question from the Conservative spokesperson. I agreed he could raise a point of order. We informed the government and they came back to say that the health minister wanted to respond to the point of order. She did, on Zoom into the chamber. She was nowhere near the CERNEV at the time, but she immediately clarified the situation and corrected the record. Everyone is happy, scrutiny done, truth served, parliamentary standards upheld. Given today's events in another place, then at least one former politician could learn a thing or two about the need to correct uh, the record and to do so at pace and with humility. Hybrid working, of course, has not only introduced a more level playing field among members for plenary purposes, some of whom previously spent up to 10 hours a week on the dreaded A470 between North and South. It is also breaking down geographical barriers for citizens engaging with the Senev. This evening being a case in point, of course, as, uh, as people uh, listen to this lecture uh, virtually, probably on sofas uh, sitting uh, in their homes. Very, very recently, we have been collaborating with My Society in making our work accessible in new ways through They Work For You portal. We're probably with, we're working with academic researchers like Christina Leston Bandera to better understand the barriers, both real and perceived, that prevent people from engaging in the decisions that matter to them. Her work with the Senev and Westminster Petitions Committees will give us new insights to ensure we are living up to our desire to put citizens at the heart of our work. As a parliament, we need to innovate continually because the needs and expectations of the communities that we serve are constantly evolving too. This is particularly important when we examine the role our committees play in holding the government to account and ensuring that committee works acts as a mirror to, cont to contemporary Welsh society. That means not only reflecting the challenges that our communities face, but also the diversity of the people who live in them, be that age, gender, race, religion, or socioeconomic status. With that in mind, in 2020, Professor, Professor Diana Sturbu of London Metropolitan University was commissioned through the Senev Research Academic Fellowship Scheme to explore the power, influence, and impact of Senev committees. The aim was to develop a framework to evaluate the effectiveness of committees in the sixth Senev. Professor Sturbu conducted the research between sem September 2020 and January 21, beginning by reviewing the current evidence and literature on effectiveness of parliamentary committees. The work culminated in a detailed report, including 13 key recommendations, ranging from making diversity monitoring common practice to building internal capacity through expansion of internships and fellowships to making livid, lived experience central to committee's approach to evidence. The last recommendation I mentioned chimes with one of the Senate Commission's three existing corporate goals, to have citizens at the heart of all we do. And I'm heartened that our committees are already making progress in this regard. Diversity monitoring work is already underway, and I'm looking forward to seeing the results of our second pilot phase on this in the autumn. Our engagement team continues to set the benchmark for linking the lived experience of people with the work con conducted by committees. Recently, we have conducted groundbreaking engagement with migrant women, care leavers, and gypsy Roman traveler communities. 
groundbreaking engagement leading to game-changing recommendations for our committees and life-changing alterations to government policy. New committees have been formed in recent years too, more evidence of the innovation required to keep up with the pace of change around us. Earlier, I mentioned the Special Purpose Committee on Electoral Reform. This was established in October 21 to consider the conclusions previously reached by the Committee on Senate Electoral Reform in the Fifth Senate and to make recommendations for policy instructions for a Welsh Government Bill on Senate Reform in May 2022. The work of this committee succeeded in maintaining the momentum in the debate surrounding electoral reform whilst being mindful of the need to move at pace if changes were to be implemented in time for our next Senate election in 2026. More recently, and in what has been described by commentators as a highly unusual agreement between the Labour Welsh Government and the Welsh Conservatives this time, a motion was passed in the Senate to set up a special committee to examine the decisions taken during the COVID pandemic in Wales. The committee will act following the publication of each UK inquiry module and will explore any Wales specific issues identified in those reports. Another innovative feature of this new committee is its chairing arrangements. It has been agreed by a motion in plenary that the committee will have co-chairs, one Conservative, one Labour, and the first such example in the Senate's history, and relevant procedures are being developed to support this model as we speak. Come back to us in two years' time to see how a co-chaired parliamentary committee has worked. This brings me to my final theme this evening, to complement politics and purpose, that of progress. And to co comprehend how far we've come, it's always helpful to remind ourselves where we started. When I first was elected to the Assembly, and before the separation of the legislature and executive, we were one corporate body. Members even shared an email domain with civil servants in the Welsh government. I was ellen.jones at wales.gov.uk. In fact, I might have been ellen.jones6 at wales.gov.uk. That led to all kinds of mishaps, as you can imagine. As you know, there are lots of Joneses in Wales. And I remember the 2001 foot and mouth epidemic. And as it happens at the time, the government's head of agriculture and the Plaid Cymru assembly member, Father Conroy, both shared the same name, Gareth Jones. This meant that several useful Welsh government briefings inadvertently ended up being shared with Plaid Cymru and chief veterinary complex scientific foot and mouth advice meant for the head of department and minister never reached the right inbox and was quietly read by the assembly member for Arthur Conroy sitting in Llandidno probably. It wasn't until the Government of Wales Act 2006 that separation between executive and parliament was formalized and we secured the clarity required around both institutions respective responsibilities to pave the way for robust scrutiny mechanisms. We have had noticeable milestones as a parliament. In 2003, the Senate became the first parliament in the world to secure gender balance amongst its members, 50-50. 2011, Wales became the first nation in the UK to introduce a carrier bag levy, such a simple concept which resulted in a 90% reduction in carrier bag usage and made people more aware of their impact on their natural environment. 2015, the Senate passed deemed consent legislation on organ donation, resulting in Wales having the highest consent rate of all the UK nations. And in 2018, Wales's young people elected the first ever Welsh Youth Parliament, with 40 constituencies contested by an impressive 480 candidates and an additional 20 members elected from partner organisations. There are many more examples of progress I could cite, but I'm eager to stress that this institution is far from complacent. On gender equality, today's percentage of female members has dipped slightly below half. So the sixth Senate Women's Caucus launched just a few weeks ago has important work to do to push that figure back to 50% and beyond. We also expect legislation on gender quotas to be brought forward at some point before the next Senate election as part of the Ply Cymru Welsh Government cooperation agreement. On bilingual working, whilst our counterparts in Canada and the Republic of Ireland look to us for exemplary practice, our official language scheme continues to rightly hold our feet to the fire and explore ways of increasing the use of Welsh, 
particularly in, in committees. This is a bilingual parliament, and it is chaired by me and my deputy almost exclusively in Welsh. The chairing is then monolingual almost, um, but it is a bilingual par parliament where both Welsh and English are spoken and used. And on ensuring that business is conducted properly and e efficiently, our newly established procedures and parliamentary skills service is already looking at what changes will be required to facilitate as smooth a transition as possible to the seventh Senate. So in what may well be a first for me, I will quote Winston Churchill and the words he used in defense of the Westminster Chamber. We shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us. I happen to believe this is true of our Senate too. The horseshoe configuration of our de debating chamber gives primacy to consensus over confrontation. It was deliberately designed that way in 2005. Our 360 degree democracy encourages us to understand each other's perspectives. And whilst plurality of thought is something which undoubtedly enriches our democracy, I, th I know that where agreement is to be found, our members will always strive to find it. I began my remarks this evening by reflecting on the pace of change with which the Senate has come of age in its 24 years of being. It may well be that the transition between the 6th Senate and the 7th Senate will be the most transformational yet. And the 2021, af after the 2021 election, a third of Senate members were first-time parliamentarians. In 2026, subject to the passing of a reform bill, we can expect even more new faces, each one needing to navigate a labyrinth of processes, procedures, rooms and rules at pace. But I say this with hope rather than trepidation, knowing that they, like me, will be supported by the very best in their field. The first strategic aim of our corporate body is to provide outstanding parliamentary support. And I know that Senate Commission officials take that aim seriously every day. I also must mention our plenary and committee clerks, many of whom I see before me tonight, whose expertise and unstinting independence enables each committee chair and myself to fulfill our duties with clarity and confidence. I'd like to end, therefore, with something for you to ponder. I know that everyone here this evening believes in the principle that we are parliaments of equals, that when it comes to engaging with each other, we can learn as well as teach, listen, and share. And share. You may also have worked out by now that I have legislative form when it comes to implementing name changes. So in recognition of the innovation that has made us all what we are today, then let me be cheeky enough to offer you a challenge. You are the study of parliament group, I understand. Why not become the study of parliaments group? What a meaningful difference just one S could make. Thank you again for asking me to share some of my experience and my thoughts with you tonight. And as one of those politicians who comes and goes into a parliament's life, let me thank all of you who craft, design, and redesign our parliamentary structures and do so, so that we can better deliver for the people we all serve. Thank you so much, Evan. Uh, and you've kindly said that you are happy to answer questions.